this is uh, this is actually a shot of our locations in 2019. It's not the 2020 map. Um, the, the green dot, the green pins are our corn locations, and the brown pins were our soybean locations in 2019. And you can see I got a photo there. Managed to get a photo of Jake actually taking notes in a corn plot, he, and he spends a lot of time doing that. So, hats off to him because he covers a lot of ground in the fall, uh, walking all these plots, or the majority of them, I should say, not every single one. All right, this is what the data looks like. And don't worry, I'm not gonna try to pull this all apart for you right now. I just wanted you to see this, I think, look, this is our 2020 85 to 95 day trial. This is the one that, the one that we own. I think there's 12 or 13 locations here and it's sorted by moisture. And you can see there's moisture and yield and stock lodging and root lodging, et cetera, some height information. And so this is ultimately um, an important part of what we do is it take this data, look at it, slice it and dice it again, depending on what we're trying to sort out. Is it root lodging? Is it stock lodging? Is it maybe we pull apart the locations and look at how it did in South Dakota or west of uh, west of Mississippi or something like that. So this is the data we get. Similarly, um, this is our soybean, one of our soybean data sets from this year. And I really, this trial I, I really like because we put in all, you know, again, Viking is 100% conventional and non-GMO. And so um, we, we don't have any Roundup or enlist beans in a Viking bag, but we do want to compare our soybeans and our experimentals against some industry checks. So in this trial, you'll see all of our conventional beans, as well as industry checks from Has Grown Pioneer, uh, and, and some enlist beans and GT27 beans, etc. This trial is sorted by, the one we're looking at right here, is sorted by maturity. And I think Matt is going to post a link so that if anybody's interested, they can go to all four of these soybean trials, um, take a look at them. Because I, I think it's useful information. For example, if you're, if you're considering growing something like an Iowa 2104 down here, how does that yield compared to the highest yielding bean in the trial? Um, and I think the, the gap is pretty significant, like 12 bushels or 13 bushels. And so you, you want to make sure that you're getting an adequate premium if you're going to grow one of these in this case, Iowa 2104 is a large seeded yellow hilum, high protein soybean, and it's it's definitely given up yield. So this is that's the kind of thing that this data is really helpful for. All right, now we're gonna jump into choosing right hybrid for your goals, your ground. And and the first step of that for us used to be to, you know, simple, we would just say, hey, what maturity corn do you want? You want a 95 day, you want a hundred day. And that's become more complicated because in recent years with uh, increased use of cover crops uh, and some folks even trying things like um, relay crop, farmers are starting to think about, well, what happens if I move a, a 95 day corn down into 105 day corn country? How much yield am I giving up? And the truth is, I don't think anybody has a real firm answer on that yet, but some universities are starting to do studies around this. And I've got a couple slides on that and I'll talk about it in a minute. But the key questions that we think you should be asking yourself is, okay, are you going for an early harvest? So you're gonna, in other words, you're gonna try to plant at the end of April, early May or whatever your normal planting date is, um, and then try to harvest it as early as possible. Um, or are you going for a late planting, meaning you have a cover crop out there right now and you want to maybe cut it for uh, baleage? And so you want to let that, that winter triticale grow as late as you can. Um, and then before you cut it for baleage and, and then plant your corn late or maybe your soybeans late. And so those are different, those are different scenarios and, and maybe would involve different hybrid or soybean choices. And <clears throat> uh, that's the kind of thing that we need to know from you when you're calling up to, um, to talk to us about which ones you should be planting. The other thing to obviously to take into consideration is your drying equipment, because um, if you're planting really late and you wanna make sure your corn is dry because you're gonna haul it to town, that's gonna influence your planting or your hybrid choice. I'm gonna take a drink here. All right. Um, so here's a study that, uh, that gets to this a little bit. And I just put this up to show that um, there is starting to be data available. And this actually is an old study that Margaret Smith dug out for me from Iowa State. Um, they did a three year study, 98, 99 and 2000. And they looked at planting date and hybrid maturity. And if you wanna come back later and, and actually look at the slide, you can Google it. Here's the actual um, URL to look at the study itself. And this, it's important to know, this wasn't really looking at planting date and hybrid maturity in relation to cover cropping. 
or relay cropping, but it does start to point out some things. And here's the data. Not going to spend a lot of time pulling this apart, um, but you can see table the top of this slide. So table one shows these different maturity corns on the right, and they used uh, multiple hybrids from Pioneer and DeKalb and Syngenta, and they planted them these these different maturities at these different dates. And these are the yields up here, and then down here. Um, same hybrid, same planting dates, same, um, same everything except for the, these are the moistures. And so when you start to pull this apart, you can learn some things. I think one interesting thing to me was if you plant it on time on April 28th um, for those averaged over three years, and this, this is the Nashua location, there wasn't much yield difference between 100 and 110 day corn. Now, 20 years later in 2020, we'd be looking at higher yields than they were looking at then, right? And so maybe there would be more significant yield differences, but I think that's kind of interesting. The other thing you'll notice though, is there were significant difference in moisture. Um, so that's the kind of thing you wanna start thinking about. And you can see how late planting date really starts to affect yield. Um, and you can kind of pull this data apart to begin to look at, well, what does it mean to plant a 95 day corn in 105 day corn country? And, there's not an answer here, but it, it's it's good to it's good to be aware that this data exists and um, to help us make those choices. This is a study that was done by uh, Ohio very recently. This just came out um, earlier this year, and here they actually were looking at the agronomic performance of short season and full season corns, and specifically to figure out how they would. How, they, how that would impact hybrid choice in cover cropping situations. So there's their core ideas, right? So the same thing is true for us. We don't have much of a window to plant cover crops after corn harvest. And what happens if we tried to plant early hybrids would, to give us more of a window? And so at the bottom I put, so for them ultra early meant 90 to 100 day and full season was 104 to 109 day. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this data. You can see one thing to note though, is that like all studies that had its own issues. And so in their area in 2016 and 2017, it rained a lot in the spring and they couldn't get planted on time. So in both of those two years, the study was planted late. So it was planted late May, early June. And when they planted late, then you can see the hybrid differences weren't, were significant and in some, you know, you're looking at 19 bushels of difference between this high, this maturity group versus this maturity group. But also because it was planted late, you're looking at huge differences in moisture and huge differences in um, test weight. And so when you when you average those things out, you can see there was only a $20 per acre return difference between from a 100 day corn to 109 day corn. And that if the difference is only $20, then maybe that would be enough to justify um, planting those earlier hybrids so that you could get more of a window to plant your cover crop. Um, on the bottom there, they separated this out because that in 2018, they managed to plant that one on time. And there you can see the yields, yield differences are also very significant. The moisture differences are less significant and the returns are, are, much, are much greater on the full season corn. And again, this is just one study, but it's, it's good to know the universities are actually starting to work on this because people do wanna know um, what's, what's going to happen if I plant an early hybrid or an early soybean variety. And then this slide, hey, Matt, can, can you folks see my, the part of my screen that shows the picture of the folks on the call? Uh, no, I can't. I, all okay. I see is the presentation, Mac. Good, good. I was worried that I was, my <laughs> all the photos were blocking everybody. So, um, this shows what they started to get at an analysis of well, how much more, how much more season do we have to grow our cover crop if we do harvest early? And so they didn't get into the economics of it in this study, but they did measure the growing degree unit differences and the precipitation differences. And you can see that in 2017 at the Bucyrus location, for example, if they harvested on October 18th rather than November 9th. Uh, they got another 232 growing degree units on that cover crop, and they got another four inches of rain. So obviously that's going to make a huge difference if you're trying to establish, say, winter rye in a roll down rye situation the following spring. And so that, that starts to get at this question of, well, is it worth it to plant an earlier hybrid or an earlier soybean variety? There's no definitive answer here. It's just one study, but it's good to know that these folks are starting to work on it. 
Um, so these are the key takeaways that I that I've pulled out of that Ohio study. So planting date and harvest date are key, as we already talked about. Um, hybrid selection is critical, and that's what Jake and I are going to talk about in a minute. So or in a minute rather. So they noticed that some hybrids did just fine when they, some of the early hybrids rather did just fine and were very competitive. And some of the early hybrids really didn't perform well and gave up a lot of yield and intactness. And Jake and I'll talk about that in a minute. In this one study, the ultra early hybrids yielded nine to 10% less, okay, when planted at a normal time frame. Um, and then the other things we already talked about. All right, so, um, so this is, I don't expect you to memorize this, but I want you to know that we are thinking about which of our hybrids and which of our soybean varieties move south as early planted hybrids in case you are wanting to relay crop or have a shorter season for, so you have more time to plant a cover crop. And Jake, maybe you would talk a little bit about how you make the decision here about which column you put a hybrid in. Um, yeah. Uh... Based, most of it's just based on my observations, especially these past few years, I feel it's been, uh, they've really come very, I, I, don't know, I don't know how I don't want to say this, but uh, basically when I look at, when I'm taking my observations and then looking at the yield data that we get from our replicated trials that Mac mentioned earlier, um, you know, I marry up my observations with that yield data. Um, you know, I've seen hybrids such as 8405 all the way down as far south as Champaign, Illinois, Look the exact same there as it did in Olivia, Minnesota, which is, you know, 100 miles to the northwest of Albert Lee. Um, so that to me tells me that that hybrid is very well adapted to to handle a large range of motion north to south uh, and east to west as well. Um, so it, it kind of it's a combination, like I said, of marrying up my my observations with with some yield data. Um, that kind of helps me place these hybrids into this, these two columns, move south or, or not so much. And then we also take into account um, grower experience as well. You know, we, that anecdotal evidence from, from our growers, from our customers, you know, we listen to you and uh, we take that into account as well. But, uh, you know, we, Mac and I kind of went through this list and yeah, this, there are some exceptions. There's some overlap areas, you know, if you were to look at a map, but uh, I, I feel this lineup right here is, is pretty solid. Yeah, thanks, Jake. And the, the, my my message here is that just give us a call, and we'll if you have a particular need for something like this, we will help you make the right decision. Because um, you can't always pick it out of the catalog or the or the charts. So now we're going to talk a little bit about other condition, other field conditions that you might be trying to choose hybrids for. And I'm going to let Jake talk about um, we're comparing here heavy wet soils versus drought prone soils and how he makes those decisions. Right. Um... So again, here, you know, this is kind of what I think about um, when I think of heavy wet versus drought prone. Um, you know, some of you growers might have, might have some different opinions and, and that's great. Um, you know, everybody's ground is a little bit different. Um, so it's kind of starting on the, the left side there, the heavy wet soils. You know, I, myself, I farm heavy, heavy clay. Um, you know, this summer in August, it almost turned into cement um, in the fields and my corn and beans just kind of went stagnant without a lot of water late season. Um, doesn't drain out very easily because of that, because of that those uh, that compaction issue. It can it can really hold water real well. Um, and without tile, it's some of that ground can be pretty tough to farm. Um, you know, but some key hybrids that I feel kind of handle that situation very well. Um, right there, 5296, 9900. Um, you guys can see the list there. And then there are some hybrids that are watchouts, you know, that maybe don't handle that quite so well, whether that be uh, a disease issue or doesn't quite hold out, um, doesn't quite have the root strength to push through some of that, that wet ground, um, 4696, 5502, uh, just as examples. And, and again, pl please call us and ask if we're, um, you know, we're more than willing to talk to you and, and help you through some of these situations. Um, you know, and then onto the, the drought prone soils. And, and this year, it was great getting out into the into those plots and looking at um, this situation because vastly different from the last, from last year even. Um, but what I consider drought prone soils, um, lighter sand, uh, gravelly type soils, uh, you get, you move west and you get into some of those, those gumbo soils. 
that don't maybe uh, hold water quite so well, um, or just even you know even heavily tiled ground can be considered drought prone because it drains so fast. So, so that's something to take into account as well. Um, and we do have hybrids that match those um, those types of environments as well. 6886. That's actually an artesian hybrid, so it's been selected for for extreme drought tolerance. Uh, 5195, our best seller. That one has continually proven itself um, moving west and in, in, into lighter ground. 5200, that's a new one um, for 2020 this year and uh, really shine. Um, a lot of good results on that one. You know, the washouts would be um, those hybrids down below 5296, 5104, don't quite handle the those some of those hybrids are a little deeper kerneled, so they they do a lot more grain fill later on, and and if it's a droughty situation, that can really hurt them. All right, thanks. Uh, similarly, one way to think about choosing a hybrid is you have really highly productive ground where you're going for top bushels for per acre, 220, 240 or more. Versus some, there are there are pieces. Obviously, most farms or some farms have some pieces of ground that are less productive. So, how do you how do you characterize the use, Jake? Um, well, the highly productive ground. When you think about you know that that flat black dirt, um, higher uh, high level of organic matter, uh, relatively neutral pH, um, you know water that you know or ground that might be tiled well um, or irrigated even. But just those acres that have extremely high yield potential, um, see a lot of this in, uh, uh, I kind of think of like the Highway 20 uh, area through corridor through Iowa um, as some of, is probably some of the best ground that I've ever seen um, in that situation. So, and, and you growers, you know your ground, you know, a lot better than we do. And uh, so that's just kind of how, how I characterize it. Uh, some of you might disagree. Some of you might might have difference of opinion, and that's fine. Um, uh, like again, that's that's why we like to talk to you and and, and learn more. Um, you know, over to the less productive ground. Um, you know that yield ceiling quote there. You know that seem I characterize that as ground that doesn't seem to matter what you do to it. You know, it could be tiled perfectly. It could be. Um, you know, you have the perfect fertility out on there, but for some reason that ground just never hits higher than 160 or 180 bushels, something like that. Um, you know, or it's low organic matter, or it's that sandy ground that doesn't hold fertility very well. That what I that's what I classify as you know less productive. It just doesn't seem to want to give you that that top end that you're going to see uh, with some of that flat black dirt. Um, Good. Go ahead, Max. Um, so I don't know, we don't probably need to go through all the hybrids here, but you can see again that we've got them characterized this way and we're happy to talk to you when you call up, uh, talk to you about the differences between these hybrids. One thing I want to focus on on the next slide a little bit is we, we launched this year and some of you have seen this maybe in our catalog or on our website, we launched Viking workhorse hybrids and these are aimed at those less productive acres. And so that our thought was, well, most of the time, Jake and I and Brian are trying to find the highest yielding most agronomically stable hybrids we can. And those tend to be the newest hybrids with very high royalties, they're single crosses, they're expensive to produce, and they're they therefore they cost more. And we thought, well, what if they're what if we what if we on purpose launched some hybrids that were aimed at those less productive acres and that had a lower cost, right? And that still had a potential to go 180 or even 200 bushels in an ideal situation. But maybe they got a little bit of a yield ceiling, but they're drought tolerant. They're very stable, they're widely adapted, they probably could be dual purpose, they're tall enough to be dual purpose. And we, and we went out and selected a couple of hybrids and this year we only have two and depending on how this catches on, we may have four next year. Um, and these are specifically aimed for those less productive acres and they're cheaper because A, they're produced using modified female parents. So we get more seed produced per acre and that reduces our cost of good. They have a lower royalty on them. They're also flat price. So these are $118 a bag and that's their price and there's no early pay discount. So they just stay at $118 a, uh, per bag all year long. There is a volume discount available if you buy more than 40 bags. I think you can take a couple bucks off or if you buy a large amount, it's, it's a larger volume. And there's also no cruiser insecticide on this. So it doesn't, so that means they have fungicide only and they would, we wouldn't recommend them 
on, on ground where you expected to have an insect problem, where you had high organic matter or lots of manure, you thought you, or you were turning over uh, uh, a hay field, for example, you might have a, uh, some kind of an insect issue. These wouldn't be good choices for those situations. But I wanted to take a minute to talk about those workhorse hybrids. All right, uh, another one we wanted to talk about was choosing a Viking hybrid for corn on corn. And remember that all Viking hybrids are conventional non-GMO, so we don't have any rootworm traits in any of our corn. So maybe talk about that a little, Jake. Right. Um, so, you know, corn on corn, especially this year, we saw kind of a rise in, in rootworms. And I think that's kind of a, a, a double hit considering that we, you know, corn on corn, for one, you know, you're, you're kind of having that optimum uh, food source for them. But two, we had kind of a perfect spring for them. Um, it was relatively warm. We didn't have, you know, the 50 inches of rain that we've had uh, the previous couple of years. So a lot the uh, the success rate of those eggs was higher than in the past few years. So, you know, when I think of corn on corn, the first thing that I want to think about is, is that rootworm management. Um, what can you do to help alleviate that? You know, and there are there are um, insecticide options that you can use. Because uh, seed treatment doesn't do it, um, you know, cruiser, you know, the Cruiser 250 that's on most of our Viking corn, it's not going to cover you. Um, so you got to think about other options such as a liquid or a granular option at planting or before planting. Um, and the the last option is you know rotation. Uh, if you check out our catalog, uh, we've got a, a full page coverage on rootworm control. Um, hopefully that'll help you out. Uh, the other thing to think about uh, when I when I think of corn on corn is residue management. You know, stocks, the genetics in corn is getting better and better all the time. Stocks are getting stronger, um, heavier. They don't break down quite as fast. Uh, so I usually recommend promoting that faster breakdown, you know, chopping stocks, whether that be run a flail chopper, chopping corn head. Uh, myself, I take a lot of stocks off um, for cattle bedding. So that's an option too. And one more thing to remember with residue management, there are a lot of diseases that do overwinter on corn residue. Um, so, so we have to think about that um, as well, where you know, you gotta go back and think, did I have uh, any disease issues in my field, whether that be goss wilt, uh, anthracnose, uh, any number of tar spot has been a new one, which I'll touch on here in a minute. So, and then some key Viking hybrids there, you can look at that little list, and that's just a, a real small list. We've got other hybrids um, that, can, that can handle the situation very well um besides hey mac and jake sorry to sorry to interrupt here for a second we had a question come in on the chat about uh yield data on workhorse hybrids is that something we have published on the web or is that something we'll um have available or someplace we can direct folks good question so um i'm gonna actually make a note of that because we do now have some yield data from 2020 um and and i'll make an effort with chance and Ashley to get that data up on the web so people can see, okay, how like what how much yield am I giving up? And again, they're they're aimed at those those acres that probably have like 180, 190 bushel yield ceiling, but maybe some most years they can go somewhere between 130 to 170 bushel. That's kind of where they're they're aimed at, although they have more potential. But yeah, good, good question, and we will get some data up. Right. Thanks, Matt. Um uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, disease history on your field uh, is another very important thing to think about when selecting corn hybrids. Um, you know, the first one I'll talk about, relatively new, <clears throat> uh, those of you in southern Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, West, eastern Iowa, uh, have unfortunately gotten to be pretty familiar with, or getting to be pretty familiar with this disease. Um, it is a complex, it is a, 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 like a triple infection of fungi. It is relatively new. This one has been prevalent in South America. Uh, they've been dealing with this a long time down there. And it's moving. Um, as you can see on the map here uh, on the right side, I pulled that uh, from the University of Wisconsin. Now we first saw this pop up in 2015, uh, in North Central Illinois, and it's slowly making its way around the Corn Belt, um, coming across Iowa. Uh, as you can see this year, um, the yellow 2020, we did see some here in Freeborn County um, and Faribault County, Minnesota for the first time. Uh, so it's a little scary as in just five short years, how fast this thing's moving. And there's not a lot of 
uh, ratings on that yet from our, our uh, genetic suppliers, but they are starting to take note of it and we are starting to get uh, more information on, on how well our hybrids can handle it. And as you can see in the picture there below, that's what it looks like. I mean, it literally looks like someone dipped their fingers in tar and just speckled it all over the corn leaves. Um, and this year, fortunately, I think we were dry enough late that uh, the secondary infection didn't get to take hold and it really can cover a leaf, which really affects your photosynthetic rate within that plant. Um, two more quick ones to think about in Thracnose. Uh, we saw a lot of top die back in 2018 and 2019. A lot of that caused by anthracnose um, stalk rot and leaf blight. Um, there are more work being done with uh, the ASR trait. We have one here in our 5296. Um, so that's another thing that's getting more, becoming more of a thought with breeders. And we are seeing a lot more um, hybrids coming through that way. And then goss welt, um, just another bacterial infection that we are. Uh, always conscious of, uh, especially out west. Um, we saw it in 2019 as far north as uh, north, all the way up in North Dakota in the Red River Valley. Um, so it, it, that's another one that is moving quite well. And that one does overwinter on corn residue. Um, so rotation is is one of going to be one of your key um, key ingredients into fighting that one. Thanks, Jake. The only thing I'd say on this slide is we didn't put up high. We didn't put up the hybrids on here that we have that we feel are are well suited for people that are concerned about one or more of these diseases, but we do have ratings on several of our hybrids on tar spot, for example. So again, if you are concerned about any of these in particular, please give us a call and we'll try to get you set up with the right hybrid. And now we're going to talk about a few hybrids. First, uh, Jake's going to talk through three new ones. Um, you want to take it away? Yep. Yep. Thanks, Mac. Again. Um... First one I'll, I'll mention here, 8089, uh, at an 89 or 90-day hybrid. Uh, 2019, 2018, we tested it both years. Um, and then again, this year in 2020, it has been a very good high yield potential hybrid. Um, I was very impressed with how this thing looked um, all, all season long, really, walking plots. Um, as you can see there, very good competition against you know, Pioneer 9188. Um, uh, up in, uh, especially in kind of central Minnesota and moving north. Um, this thing is equipped well to handle lighter ground um, if it's irrigated. Uh, I saw this one in St. Cloud and it just looked phenomenal and it blew my mind away and how well this thing looked. Grain quality was very nice. Uh, it is a little bit taller plant. It does come south well, as we say there in the bullet point. Um, so if you're looking for an earlier option, uh, that's definitely one that uh, kind of fits the bill. Uh, next one there, 4602. Uh, I was this one kind of ran away with uh, the Iowa State trials in, in 2019. Um, had a very good year uh, again this year in 2020. Um, probably one of the hybrids that has the strongest stocks that I've seen in a while. Um, last year in 2019, we had a, a, a fairly large wind event um, across southern Minnesota, northern Iowa. I got out about a week later to walk some plots, and this was probably the least instance of green snap um, out of the 50, 60 hybrids that I looked at. Um, easily less than 5% across all locations that I hit. Um, I walked about, I think, six or seven locations in, the, in that zone. Um, as you can see, very good yield potential again, uh, competing against Pioneer 0157, uh, Decal 4972 uh right there with them if not if not better in most locations and this hybrid is actually that hybrid actually we launched it originally as an organic hybrid and it did so well there we brought it into our conventional lineup as well <clears throat> 5811 uh another brand new one last one in the in the new category this one outdid our 5312 uh pretty handily um, both in 2019 and here in 2020 um, as you can see there, it topped our internal trials, 250 bushel, um, going all the way across from eastern Nebraska, um, all the way into Indiana um, last year. Um, not so much this year, I lost some locations uh, of, our, of our testing due to uh, the duration. But, but there again, you can see 2020, still bringing a lot of yield potential given it went through some pretty disastrous wind, drought situations. 
Um, still competing very well with Pioneer 1197. Uh, I really like this hybrid. I think it, uh, it is going to be a, a good fit for a lot of areas. It does move south into Missouri uh, quite well. Um, in fact, so yeah, big range of motion east to west, north to south. I'm not afraid of this hybrid going into a lot of different areas. And now uh, these are some older hybrids and we just wanted to give you a flavor of like, we have 295 days, why do you plant the one and not the other? And, and I'm gonna let Jake talk about this too. Right, um, these are actually sister hybrids. Um, they actually share a parent. And it was, so it's kind of interesting to see how they've done the last two years. You know, 2018, 2019, the 5296 really stood out in handling the wet conditions uh, extremely well. And that comes from that infractional stock rot resistance it has, as I mentioned before, it does have that ASR trait built into the plant, which is a natural trait, it's not a GMO. It does have decent drought tolerance, um, but I would wanna keep it on, on kind of a more medium to, to heavier soil. 5195, now that one uh, we saw this year do what it's always done and it stood out in the drought. Um, it, it actually outdid the, the 96 day by just a couple bushel. And so that's kind of where I'm placing these two. You want you, your lighter, dry, droughtier ground, let's go 5195. Uh, your heavier, uh, maybe more water holding capacity type ground, uh, 5296 is where uh, is probably the better way to go. Jake, do these both move east and west equally well? Very well, yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, we've seen that 95 day down in Illinois as an early hybrid doing well. 5296, we've seen that one go out into South Dakota and, and do well. So yeah, their range of motion east to west is very good. Uh, here again, 200 days, you know, why would I plant one over the other? Well, kind of the same story as the previous slide, you have your wet ground hybrid in the 9900 versus your more drought prone um, hybrid with 5200. Um, this year, they, they split themselves apart. This year, again, uh, 5200 coming out on top in a lot of uh, public trials, um, did really well in, in our replicated data um, with the drought conditions. But not to take away from 9900, it still did well. It has a little better green quality overall, um, heavier test weight. And it was regularly um, you know, one of the best standing corns in, in those wet conditions, um, kind of even beating out some you know, Pioneer 157 and a couple of decalb numbers in terms of agronomics late season. So very pleased with both of these. Yeah, the thing that 9900 really did in, in 2018 and 2019, when we had a lot of wet ground and a lot of uh, people complaining about standability in the late fall. We got a lot of comments on how 9900 was their best standing corn, and that's why it's the first bullet point. It, it really took the wet waterlogged soils and just sailed through it, and, and that's where it, it's going to do it's, it's going to really impress people. Right. Uh, here again, this, these two hybrids, um, they kind of, to me, they split themselves out more in a north versus south situation. Um, 8405, like I said, that's probably one of the most consistent hybrids I've seen across locations, but it, it seems to pick up more going south um, and even west into some lighter ground. 4205, that's my more northern, uh, more eastern pick, um, going into the higher production grounds um, and staying north. It, uh, it, they, that's where they pull themselves apart. There is that little overlap area, kind of the I-90 corridor, you know, down to, you know, the first couple of couple of tier counties in Iowa, they, they go back and forth quite a bit. But as you start moving north and south of that, that region, that's when they really start to pull apart um, in terms of their performance. Like I said, north and east, 4205, um, south and west, 8405 are my, my choices. This is just a little, uh, you know, we, we sent out a lot of these postcards this fall where our hybrids in these first trials, which and by the way, all the first trials have Roundup corn and Acre Max corn and um, all the different traits in them. But we put conventional hybrids just to show, hey, conventional hybrids 
not only can they yield, they can they they can compete really well. We had a lot of wins again this year. That 8405 that Jake just talked about here is, is in Easton, Minnesota. Um, I don't know how many. Yeah, first place out of 60 hybrids in the trial. Uh, again, this is a first trial that's replicated and hit almost hitting that 300 bushels. So we got to crow a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Um, and we do for those of you that are looking for dual for looking for silage, we do not carry a brown midrib or a leafy uh, silage specific hybrid. Uh, instead, when we look for hybrids that are um, dual purpose and that test really well for silage, and so we don't label them as dual purpose unless we have actual data behind it. And so this is a slide from our catalog where you can see, like for example, Viking forty two ninety two versus uh, Master's Choice. And not to pick on master's choice, but just being very competitive for milk per ton and milk per acre. Same way with the other hybrids. And we have, we got four of them listed here, but we actually have a few other hybrids that aren't on this page that are excellent dual purpose corn. And we have the data to back it up. So for those of you that are looking for some silage corn, um, don't rule us out because uh, we have some very, very competitive hybrids. Uh, 5104 has, it's actually, it's actually one silage trial, like two years ago, won the University of Minnesota Southeast Silage Trial, if my memory's right. Um, so we've got some competitive silage hybrids is what I'm saying. And please, if you have questions, please give us a call. All right, now we're gonna jump into soybeans. And I don't know, what do we have left, Matt? About not quite 10 minutes? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so we'll, um, I'll maybe skate through these a little faster just to try to get to the good stuff. Um, again, uh, we are thinking about choosing, helping you choose soybeans that might move south better as either late planted or uh, early harvest soybeans so that you can work in uh, a cover crop. Um, and so we're looking at these closely and we've listed some of them on these, this uh, slide here uh, that we feel move south very well. And Jake has lots of notes and we've taken uh, comments from customers on these, most of these as well, except the, the new one. And so these hybrid, these are soybean varieties we feel move south extremely well out of their normal zone of adaptation. Uh, I know when that, for example, that 0821, we saw that at Wesley, Iowa this year, win the plot um, at 68 bushels an acre, and, and that's a 0 0.8 maturity soybean. So that one moves south extremely well, and, and these other ones that we've listed here do as well. Um, and there are there is work beginning to be done on uh, comparing early and late soybeans. This is a this just came out a couple of days ago from the University of Minnesota, and they're comparing some one four to one sevens versus the one nines to two fours. Um, unfortunately, this is you know again each study is unique, and this one they planted it late. So what they learned here is if you planted basically June first, wasn't a heck of a lot of yield difference between the early soybeans and the late soybeans. And again, they also would say variety selection actually mattered more than maturity in this case. And you know, there's lots of questions here that aren't getting answered and, they, and they're starting to work on that as well. So well, what if we planted on May 1st, would the yield differences be significant then? Or what if there were difference, or what were the actual differences in harvest dates if we planted on May 1st? That's the kind of information that we, that we need and that we're, uh, they're starting to, to become available. Um, we'll skip through this, but these are some of the different things that we think about when we are trying to place soybeans. Um, soybean cyst nematode, obviously the disease history of different fields. Uh, you can't always predict disease, of course, because many of them are weather dependent, for example, white mold. But these are the things that will question, kind of questions we'll ask you if you call us wanting help picking a the soybean. These are, the, these are the sorts of things that we think about. One thing I will call out is we do have two Peking soybean varieties and many of the, almost all the soybeans we carry have the old PI88788 gene for cyst nematode resistance. And that is losing its effectiveness across the Midwest because we've been using that same gene for 20 years now. And uh, uh, soybean cyst nematodes have evolved around that gene and they can chew on those soybean roots where the Peking soybeans are showing good, still showing good resistance to cyst nematode populations out there. And, and these two varieties, uh, if you have ground that has a real cyst problem, these are two excellent varieties. All right, maybe Jake, you wanna talk about this, a couple of these new ones? Sure. Um, so the, the 0821 uh, at a 0.8 maturity, um, as Max mentioned earlier, southern movement is uh, pretty phenomenal. 
um, you know, going down to Wesley, Iowa, you know, near Algona and, and hitting 68 bushels, is, that's pretty special for that really being to do that. Um, and that's not to take it away how it does in, in zone. Um, still one of the highest yielding beans that we tested both in 2019, uh, again in 2020. So uh, very good standability. Uh, I did not see any issues with disease uh, this year. Granted, we were pretty dry and there, there wasn't a lot going on in a lot of those plots this year, but uh, have not, no known disease issues. Um, it does have good IDC tolerance. Uh, the emergence has, has been very exceptional. Uh, and as you can see there against uh, this uh, coming out of the University of Minnesota, that trial there, uh, it actually won that central zone um, coming in at just shy of 74 bushels. So again, pretty special, I think, for a, a 0.8 bean to hit that kind of yield level and be able to move south and, and still maintain its height, maintain its extendability, uh, and, and bring some yield with it. And I'll, I'll jump in on this one. This is a new 2.2 maturity bean. Um, and this is an aphid tolerant bean. And so we honestly don't know whether conventional farmers are going to be interested in aphid tolerant soybeans. This is mostly a thing that organic farmers are interested in because they don't have the ability to use insecticides, obviously. And the and reason we launched this conventionally and decided to try it is because it does have very competitive yields and it also has really good agronomics. So some of the aphid tolerant beans that we've had available in the past haven't stood very well or they didn't have phytophthora or they, they didn't have brown stem rot. This one has cyst resistance. It's a very good standing bean. It's a beautiful bean at harvest actually. Uh, and that multi-gene aphid resistance would eliminate the need for spraying insecticides, which, you know, um, you know, so with, uh, when, when things are tight and you can save another $10, $12 an acre with the application, maybe that's worth it. I, we really like the bean. It's performed well in our trials, very competitive for yields. And uh, so we thought we'd launch it conventionally to see if there was any uptake. Anything I missed on that one, Jake? Uh, no, I think you hit all the highlights. You know, I was going to say, but you mentioned it, that that attractive look of that bean at harvest. Uh, boy, that thing is pretty. Um, it's just got that nice golden brown color uh, and it maintains its, its standability. It doesn't lean, it doesn't lodge. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I really like the look of that bean. Good. Um, and we're sort of, Matt, if you're, or Matt or Ashley, do we have time to go through a few more slides or do you, should we stop here, do you think? You might be able to go through a couple more. Okay. Um, we're looking, we got about five minutes, so. Yeah, these four, the, the four soybeans on this slide, I think one of the reasons we put them on this slide was just to, these are four that actually do move south real well uh, out of zone. If you wanted one of these as an early bean that I know Jake's been really impressed with 1218 over, over the last three years and it moves south extremely well. Same with the, same way with the other three on this. If you were lived in 3.0 uh, soybean country and you wanted a 2.4, 2418 would have no problem filling, filling that need for you. And they bring a lot of yield. I mean, here's another one of our postcards where Viking 2155, a conventional non-GMO bean, uh, won a first trial at Laverne, uh, almost 70 bushels an acre. So these conventional beans have plenty of yield potential uh, when you manage them right. And I encourage those of you that are on the call to stick around for the next presentation, which is going to be uh, Casey Salo talking about how he had a field on his, how he has worked to grow 80 bushel conventional soybeans on his farm. He had one, he had a field average this year of 80, over 80 bushels an acre, which was pretty exciting.